is a joy to see you all again and to worship Christ with you today. We are continuing today in our Kingdom Citizens series, uh, which is a study on the Beatitudes from Matthew chapter 5. The last two weeks, Pastor Jeff walked us through the first two Beatitudes. So uh, those are blessed are the poor in spirit and blessed are those who mourn. And if you didn't get a chance to listen to those sermons, I'd highly recommend you go online and listen to those as they were quite helpful. And today we are going to look at the third Beatitude. But before we dive in, I'll tell a quick story. One of my many weird habits in life is that I enjoy walking laps around grocery stores. (laughs) I'm a big walker, and so whenever the weather isn't great or whenever it's just winter in Illinois, uh, I love finding the biggest grocery store or mall nearby and uh, just getting some steps in. (laughs) And I'll often turn on a podcast or I'll listen to a sermon or I'll even do a prayer walk. So if you see me around the perimeter of the stores just mumbling to myself, you know what's going on. Um, or I'll invite a friend to come walk and talk with me. And it's great because it is literally a giant indoor track stocked with drinks and bathrooms and everything you could ever need. And the best thing of all is that it is completely free, no membership required, except at Costco. (laughs) Anyway, a few weeks ago, I was walking around a certain store, not nearby here, so don't worry, and a shopper stopped me and asked, are you buying something or are you just walking around? (laughs) And I had a huge smile on my face because I figured she was just being friendly. (laughs) So I said, oh, I'm just walking around. (laughs) And in response, she did not smile at all. (laughs) But instead she said with what felt to be an accusatory tone a little bit, she goes, so you're not even gonna buy anything? And for a half second, I felt my smile start to fade a little bit as I was like, "Uh uh-oh, is she, is she like upset with me? But then I was like, no, 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 no way. So I smiled up again and I said, nope, you know, just trying to get some steps in on a rainy day, something like that. And then she let out, I think the most emphatic scowl I may have ever heard. (laughs) She goes, oh, and then she pushes her cart and walks away. And I just stood there for a second, uh, kind of shocked at, um, what I felt to be a, a little bit of a rude interaction. Um, and fortunately, I was, I was able to laugh it off, but I won't lie, for the next few days, there were moments where I thought back to that interaction. And uh, I, I started to think, you know, what could I have said in response to her to kind of like get her back for her rudeness? Um, and I, I thought, you know, may, maybe I could have said, well, I, I was thinking about buying some manners, but I see they're out of stock today. <laughs> Now, fortunately, this whole interaction was funnier to me than it was hurtful, and honestly, I have no hard feelings whatsoever, and I I truly wish the best for this woman in every way, shape, or form. Um, And I am a weirdo for walking laps around grocery stores, so I I don't blame her in that sense. But let me ask you, where do those temptations for revenge come from when we feel like we have been wronged in some way? Where do those temptations to repay evil for evil and get back at someone come from? Perhaps we could define revenge like this. Revenge is the sinful and always futile attempt to make the earth right again by repaying evil for evil. Revenge is the sinful and always futile attempt to make the earth right again by repaying evil for evil. Some people even call this settling the scores, right? Balancing the scales, getting them back for what they've done. Of course, revenge, ironically, never makes the earth right again. It actually always makes things worse. But notice that beneath every vengeful effort is a longing for justice, a longing for the earth to be made right again. And today's text shows us that there is hope, praise God, for the earth to be made right again, but it won't come through our vengeful efforts. It won't come from us taking the world by force. It won't come from us clenching our teeth and taking matters into our own hands. In fact, it will come through a far quieter but infinitely more satisfying means. 
And what is that? Why can we have hope when the world feels so broken and often evil seems to be winning? According to God's word, and Matthew 5, verse 5 in particular, we can have hope because we have a king who saves the weak, makes us meek, and will give us the earth we seek. So let me read the text for us from Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 10, and let's join in the the call and response that Pastor Jeff has been leading us through the last few weeks. So I will read the portions in white, and then let's all read the portions in yellowish orange together. So here we go, Matthew chapter uh, chapter 5, verses 3 through 10. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Today we are focusing on verse 5, the third beatitude, which is blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And this brings us to our first point. Why can we have hope when the world often seems so broken and evil often seems like it's winning? Well, first, because we have a king who saves the weak. Now, many people, when they first hear the word meek, they immediately think of the word weak, timid, fearful, passive. But biblically, this is not the case. And we'll look at some biblical examples of meekness today. But one of the best pictures of meekness and how it differs from weakness comes in a book called Humilitas, written by some random guy named John Dixon. (laughs) For those of you who don't know, by the way, John Dixon is a wonderful author, and he also happens to be one of the members of the preaching team here at Chapel Street. But in his book, Humilitas, uh, John Dixon tells the following story. He says, three young men hopped on a bus in Detroit in the 1930s and tried to pick a fight with a lone man sitting on the back of the vehicle. They insulted him. He did not respond. They turned up the heat of the insults. He said nothing. Eventually, the stranger stood up. He was bigger than they had estimated from his seated position, much bigger. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a business card, handed it to them, and then proceeded to walk off the bus and go on his way. As the bus drove on, the young men gathered around the card to read these words, Joe Lewis, boxer. <laughs> These young men had just tried to pick a fight with the man who would be heavyweight boxing champion of the world from 1937 to 1949, the number one boxer of all time, according to the International Boxing Research Organization. Second on the list, by the way, is Muhammad Ali, if you've heard of him. Dixon says, here is a man of immense power and skill, capable of defending his honor with a single devastating blow, yet he chooses to forego his status and hold his power for the good of others, in this case, for some very fortunate young men. Let me ask you, in this story, which character would you describe as weak? Was it Joe Lewis who sat by peaceably? Or was it the young men who wanted to pick a fight? Which character would you say was more secure? And which character would you say was more insecure? Did the young men's desire to gang up and mock this man, did that demonstrate strength or weakness? Meekness is not weakness, but strength under control. This is precisely what Joe Lewis demonstrated. But meekness does not require physical strength, nor is it limited to resisting a fist fight. Rather, meekness is demonstrated every time we exercise restraint for the glory of God and the good of others. 
You say, can you provide a few more examples of this? I'm still having trouble differentiating meekness from weakness. Well, so glad you asked. In this last uh, week, I put together this little chart um, comparing meekness to weakness with biblical examples of meekness that you can look up later. So if it'd be helpful, feel free. You can take a picture of the slide or you can ask me about it later and I can send it. But as I read through these, honestly ask yourself, which side of the chart can you relate to the most? Or even if there are any on the left-hand side that you can relate to. So again, the left-hand side shows weak or insecure people. So these would be the immature boys on the bus in the Joe Lewis story. The right-hand side shows meek or secure people. So let's just walk through this chart together. Weak or insecure people hide their weaknesses. Meek or secure people freely acknowledge their weaknesses. Weak people take revenge, repay evil for evil. Meek people pursue peace and leave vengeance to God. Weak people lash out in anger when aggravated. Meek people communicate the truth in love. Weak people bully or manipulate others to get what they want. Meek people show deference to others, considering others more highly than themselves. Weak people finger point and defend themselves after sinning. Meek people humbly confess their sin and turn from it. Weak people see the sin in others first. Meek people see the sin in themselves first. Weak people pridefully promote themselves. Meek people lovingly promote others. Weak people can't handle being wrong. Meek people are open to being wrong and even changing their views. So basically everyone on social media, right? (laughs) Weak people grab, hoard, take. Meek people freely and generously give. I wonder, can you relate to any of the behaviors on the left-hand side of the chart? (laughs) Can you relate to any of these characteristics of a weak person? Here's the good news. The left-hand side of the chart is all of us by nature. We all naturally hide our weaknesses. We all naturally take revenge, repay evil for evil, lash out in anger when aggravated, go right down the list. We are all naturally weak. Now you say, why in the world is that good news? Well, here's why. My favorite verse in the Bible, or one of them, is Romans 5, 6 through 8, which says, for while we were still weak, while we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die, but God chose his love for us in that while we were still weak, ungodly sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus came to rescue the weak from their miserable lifestyle of selfishness and insecurity and to bring them into a position of meekness, of strength under control. As we sing often here at our services, Jesus welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Though our sins are many, his mercy, praise God, is more. Remember the Beatitudes, they build on one another. And if you are poor in spirit enough to recognize your own weakness, and if you mourn and repent of the selfishness that we all have by nature, looking to Jesus for mercy, you are on the very doorstep of meekness and blessing. Jesus does not only want to forgive us for our sin, but he also wants to free us from our sin. He wants to transform us from weakness to meekness. So how exactly does this happen? How does Jesus make us meek? Well, this brings us to our second point this morning. Why can we have hope when the world often feels so broken and evil often seems like it's winning? Well, first, because Jesus saves the weak, praise God. But secondly, because Jesus makes us meek. Now, how do we become meek? I am convinced that there is only one way that true biblical meekness is produced in our hearts, and it's this. How do we become meek? 
we become meek, and this is up on the screen, by turning our eyes upon Jesus, the one who is both lion and lamb, and we'll look at that in a minute, the perfect embodiment of meekness or strength under control. I am convinced that if we do not see Jesus as both lion and lamb, we will never become meek. But every time we fix our eyes on these two simultaneous realities that culminate in Christ, meekness will be produced in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So let's look at each of these realities, Jesus as lion and Jesus as lamb. So first, Jesus as lion. When Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. He is quoting Psalm 37. Psalm 37. And this, in this psalm, we learn a lot about how meekness is produced, uh, is produced in us. So let me ask you, what keeps us from lashing out when someone sins against us? What keeps us from repaying evil for evil in a broken world? What frees us, as Pastor Jeff preached on a couple weeks ago, to go from closed fists, ready to fight, to open hands, ready to surrender to Jesus and give freely to others. Well, first, we must see Jesus as the lion who will bring perfect justice and will not allow any evil to go unpunished. I'm going to read the first half of Psalm 37 now. And as I read this, ask yourself, How do the promises in this passage give us hope and free us from the silliness of repaying evil for evil? Let me walk through Psalm 37 now. It says, Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like the green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. We'll skip to verse five. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn. He will make your vindication shine like the noonday sun, meaning Christian, you do not need to vindicate yourself because God promises to vindicate you. You are not your own last chance at vindication. Praise the Lord. Verse seven, be still before the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn away from wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. Now notice this, here it is. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. According to this text, we become meek and we overcome evil, not through vengeance, (laughs) But by doing good, waiting patiently for the Lord, and trusting him to bring perfect justice, the only way we will ever become meek, the only way we'll ever resist that temptation to get back at someone who has hurt us, is if we know in our hearts that Jesus is the lion who will bring perfect justice, meaning it is not up to us to settle the scores. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12, verses 19 through 21. How do we become meek? First, we must see Jesus as the lion who will bring perfect justice, which frees us from vengefulness. 
Before we move on to Jesus as lamb, I do want to make one disclaimer. I want to be crystal clear that when Jesus calls us to meekness, and when he calls us to trust that he will bring perfect justice, he's not calling us to remain in abusive relationships or never report a crime. Sometimes the way to act meekly is to have the courage to remove ourselves from abusive situations or to pursue justice for the sake of love. This is key. Meekness is not opposed to justice. Meekness is opposed to revenge. Meekness is not opposed to justice. Meekness is opposed to revenge. And we resist revenge in part by remembering that Jesus is, praise God, the lion who will bring perfect justice. But we not only need to see Jesus as lion, we also need to see him as lamb. Now you say, what do you mean that Jesus is lamb? According to scripture, Jesus is lamb in at least two ways. Number one, he is a lamb in his gentleness toward his people. One of my favorite books of all time is a book called Gentle and Lowly by Dane Ortland. If you haven't had a chance to read this book, definitely read it. Um, and Ortland opens his book by pointing out that there is only one place in all of the Gospels where Jesus explicitly reveals what's inside his heart to us. The Gospels share a lot about what Jesus did, where he came from, who his disciples were. But Ortland says this, he says, in only one place, perhaps the most wonderful words ever uttered by human lips, do we hear Jesus himself open up to us his very heart. And what does Jesus say his heart is like? Listen to what he says in Matthew 11, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle. I am gentle. That word gentle is the exact same word as meek in the Greek. The exact word that Jesus uses in Matthew 5.5. 5. Jesus says, I am gentle or meek and lowly in heart. And in me, you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In the one place where Jesus explicitly reveals his heart to us, he says, my child, if you remember one thing about my heart, let it be this, I am gentle. <laughs> Meaning meek, merciful, controlled, never flying off the handle, always fully understanding your pain and your frame. And he says, and I am lowly, meaning supremely accessible. In other words, in the lowest points of your life, Jesus says, I am there with you. In the deepest pit of your shame or your pain, Jesus says, I am there with you and for you in love. Is this the way you view Jesus' heart towards you in both the highs and the lows in life? I'm not going to lie, guys. I, this is something I desperately need as a stumbling, bumbling Christian doing my best to pursue the Lord. I need to know that I have a Savior who is gentle and lowly in heart. And praise God, Jesus is. So Jesus is lamb in two ways. First, he is a lamb in his gentleness toward his people. Second, he is the slain lamb, which we sung about earlier, who died for the sins of his people. John 1.29 says that Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Praise the Lord. Uh, Revelation 12.11 says that we conquer Satan. How? Through the blood of the lamb. Jesus being lamb reminds us that all of your sins, past, present, and future, are fully and forever forgiven through the blood of Christ. Thank you, Lord. Here's what I want us to take away from for this point. If we do not see Jesus as the lion who will bring perfect justice, we will live vengeful lives. We'll feel like we have to get, get back at those who have hurt us. And if we do not see Jesus as the slain lamb who is gentle and merciful toward all who repent and turn to him, we will live fearful lives, afraid that his coming justice is going to swallow us. 
the only way we will become meek is if we see Jesus as both lion and lamb, the place where perfect justice and perfect mercy kiss. Why can we have hope in a broken world? Because we have a king who, number one, saves the weak. Number two, makes us meek. Third and finally, King Jesus will give us the earth we seek. Notice the, uh, the, the promise at the end of Matthew 5, verse 5. It says, blessed are the meek, for they, absolutely incredible promise here, for they will inherit the earth. Almost an indescribable, unfathomable promise here, for they will inherit the earth. Now, it's worth noticing that that word inherit, notice this, implies something we must receive, right? An inheritance is not something we can earn or take. It's something Jesus must give us and praise the Lord right here in Matthew 5, verse 5, he promises to give us. In other words, those who are meek, those who are following Jesus, we do not need to death grip the things of this earth because we know that Jesus is going to give us the earth in his perfect timing. Now, let me ask you, this promise of inheriting the earth, what do you think? Is this a promise that is fulfilled now or later? What do you think? Now or later? The answer, of course, is yes, is both. Let me explain what I mean. Um, one of uh, the, um, okay, I'm sorry. Theologians and scholars, they call this inaugurated eschatology, which means that most, a, a large part of the promises that Jesus gives to us is fulfilled now, but a lot of it is fulfilled later. And here's how we see it in this particular promise. What is the earth that we long for? One of the most common images we picture is an earth where the lion lays down with the lamb, a place where justice and mercy kiss. And you can think about it, we already get a taste of that inheritance right now through Christ, where the lion and the lamb have already come together in perfect harmony. Fully God, fully man, fully lion, fully lamb. Jesus ultimately is the inheritance we long for, and we already have him right now as we sing in Be Thou My Vision, Thou, Jesus, my inheritance now and always. But we also long for a redeemed earth that perfectly reflects the beauty and meekness of Christ where all tears are wiped away, and that certainly is a future reality. And that's exactly what we are promised through Christ. Notice what it says in Revelation 5. Revelation 5, describing this new earth that we will receive, weep no more, for behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. And among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. And he, that is Jesus, the lion and the lamb, have made his people a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Pastor Jeff said last week that every sermon needs to have at least one C.S. Lewis reference. Uh, so here it is. I'll close with this. One of the best images of meekness in all of literature, I believe, is Aslan, the lion from the Narnia series. Aslan is regularly depicted as strong and mighty, but also as gentle toward his people. And in the final book of the series, The Last Battle, have any of you read The Last Battle by chance? Okay, a handful of you. In this final book of the series, uh, the children enter Aslan's country, which beautifully depicts the redeemed earth that Jesus promises to give us in Matthew 5, verse 5. And when they entered the redeemed earth, one of the characters says this. He says, I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land, or you might say the earth, I have been looking for all my life, though I never knew it till now. Lewis comments and he says, all their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever in which every chapter is better than the one before. <laughs> The earth we long for 
and the Savior we long for is not something we can take, but it's something we must receive. And today, Jesus is calling you to himself. Will you open up your hands and hearts today to receive him? Remember, Jesus welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. And today, Jesus is welcoming you into his kingdom through faith in him. Would you join me in this prayer as we close? Lord Jesus, I need you. I cannot bring about the perfect justice and mercy that I long for on my own. Forgive me, Lord, for clinging to the things of this earth rather than trusting your promise to give us all things. Oh, Lord, come into my heart today. Be the Savior and Lord and King of my life, now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. The greatest act of meekness in human history was when Jesus went to the cross for us. Uh, Philippians 2 says that Jesus did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. And on that cross, Jesus took our sin, which had left a crimson stain on our hands and hearts, and he washed it white as snow. Praise the Lord. Today we celebrate what Jesus accomplished by partaking in the Lord's table together. By the way, if you didn't get a communion cup, if you would hold up your hands, we have ushers who will come bring that to you. In this meal, we not only look back to what Christ did on the cross for us, but we also look forward to the day when he returns to give us the inheritance he has promised. On that day, we will finally see our Savior face to face and we will live forever in the earth we have always longed for. A reminder, you don't need to be a member of Chapel Street in order to partake in this meal. This is the Lord's table, not Chapel Street's table. And if you are trusting in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, this meal is for you. If you have not yet put faith in Jesus, uh, I would encourage you to use this time, instead of partaking in the meal, use this time to, to reach out to the Lord in prayer Ask Jesus to be the king and savior, the lamb and lion that you long for. If, you're, uh, if you have questions about uh, your faith or you're interested in knowing Jesus as your Lord, please come talk to me or one of the pastors after service. We would love to talk with you or pray with you. We will also have a prayer team in the classroom uh, after service. Now, for those who are partaking, if you would take the bread in your hands, and hear the words of institution. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take together. In the same way also, Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again in glory. Amen. Praise the Lord. What a Savior we have in Jesus. Now, if you guys would receive the benediction as you go. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope and mercy and meekness and love. Amen.